Tonight, details on the call that has stunned Washington. Donald Trump asked a foreign power to investigate Joe Biden. This is how a mafia boss talks. Some Democrats call it a smoking gun, but Trump? There was no pressure. What it all means for impeachment. Come on! Come on! Come on then! Britain's Prime Minister dares the opposition to take him down. Are seniors getting vitamin B12 shots they do not need? And a dire warning about the world's warming oceans. Sea levels are rising way too fast. Ian goes in-depth on the Pacific. This is The National. What a day in Washington. With the impeachment inquiry into U.S. President Donald Trump now underway, the details and the documents are piling up fast. And at the center of all of this, a phone call, a whistleblower, and a whole lot of politics. At issue is whether Trump, in that phone call, used his power to pressure the president of Ukraine to investigate Joe Biden. Today, a summary of that conversation went public. Another document was released, too, but only to Congress. It's of the whistleblower's complaints. Then there was Trump in front of the cameras at a long news conference and alongside Ukraine's president himself. Paul Hunter takes us through every step of this critical day. We're heading in now. In they went, cameras rolling, with the two leaders inside waiting for cameras to settle and the question they both knew was coming on an issue that could derail the Donald Trump presidency. To Ukraine's president, did Trump, in a phone call in July, pressure him to find dirt on Trump rival Joe Biden? We had, uh, I think, good uh, phone call. It was normal. The two spoke about many things, he said. Then... So I think, and you read it, that nobody pushed it, pushed me, yes. In other words, no pressure. This, as Democrats dissected a summary of that phone call released today by the White House. In it, Vladimir Zelensky mentions to Trump the benefit of U.S. military aid. Trump then says, I'd like you to do us a favor, and soon enough mentions Biden's son, who had financial interests in a Ukrainian company that Trump then urges Zelensky to investigate. In the summary, Trump raises it multiple times. He doesn't explicitly link U.S. aid to an investigation, but, say Democrats, it's absolutely the implication. What those notes reflect is a classic mafia-like shakedown of a foreign leader. That Trump may have used the power of the presidency to pressure Ukraine for his own political gain is a key reason Democrats yesterday launched an impeachment inquiry. And there's more. Behind closed doors tonight on Capitol Hill, lawmakers read through the whistleblower report behind all of it, said to be about several conversations between the two leaders deemed urgent when it was privately put forward. Democrats who saw it tonight say it's damning. I found the allegations deeply disturbing. I also found them very credible. For his part, at the end of his trip to New York, Trump framed it as he does. It's a joke. Impeachment for that? Okay, so Paul, even with all of that, apparently there was yet another development today about precisely what it is we might learn tomorrow, right? Uh, indeed, and it's all about that whistleblower's report. Tonight, we're hearing it characterized, but the guts of it are still secret. Tomorrow, the acting director of national intelligence, the whistleblower's boss, is set to testify on Capitol Hill. He is a Trump appointee, but today a report that he threatened to quit if he's muzzled by the White House tomorrow. The suggestion being he wants to speak candidly and will do so no matter the consequences. The story was quickly denied by all sides today, but uh, everyone's now wondering what does he want to say? How far will he go? Tonight it's got heads in this city spinning. Adrian. All right, tomorrow then, Paul Hunter in Washington. To the UK now and another leader under fire, another leader defiant. Boris Johnson was back in the House the day after the Supreme Court ruled he acted unlawfully by suspending Parliament. But there were no apologies. There was certainly no backing down. Here's Cameron McIntosh. Arriving in London, found to have shut down Parliament unlawfully, Prime Minister Boris Johnson shut himself in. As Parliament returned to work, 
that they've indoctrinated you. It's not true what you're saying. Outside, the Brexit divide was on full display. I want to get that lot to understand we are leaving the EU. I hope that people are forced to compromise a little bit more. From frustration and uncertainty here on the street, inside Parliament resumed right where it left off. Agonizing over Brexit, now with just five weeks to go. Order! It got nasty quick. Government and opposition MPs arguing over the court ruling. Man like him. Johnson absent. Like Finally emerging hours later from 10 Downing Street, not packing apologies. I think the court was wrong. Insisting he's following the will of the people, daring the opposition to take his government down. Come on! Come on! Come on then! And we can have that vote tomorrow. Johnson is still promising the UK will leave the EU even if the Brexit deadline passes without a deal. He's betting a snap election will give him a stronger mandate. The opposition wants no deal off the table. Get an extension and let's have an election! There's the stalemate. What next, what now? It's impossible. Experts say expect it to last. The strategy of the Labour leadership is basically to keep the Prime Minister hanging, looking powerless for as long as possible. Boris Johnson is in office but not in power. After all of this, Johnson faces the same problems, no sure way to deliver Brexit, and a parliament that won't support him. Cameron McIntosh, CBC News, London. Johnson also faced a barrage of criticism for invoking the late MP Joe Cox to defend Brexit. Cox was killed in a politically motivated attack prior to the 2016 Brexit referendum. I'm sorry, but it, it greatly enfeebles it greatly enfeebles this government's ability to negotiate. But what I will say is that the best way to honour the memory of Joe Cox and indeed the best way to uh, bring this country together would be, I think, to get Brexit done. And Johnson was also challenged for using words like betrayal and traitor. The opposition arguing the inflammatory language is especially dangerous because many of them face threats and abuse. All right, turning now to an urgent warning about climate change. Large parts of Canada face dire threats, according to a new report by the International Panel on Climate Change. And no matter where you live, in this country or on this planet, the scientists say without large-scale global change, you cannot escape what's coming. The consequences for nature and humanity are sweeping and severe. This report, third in a series, explores the oceans and the frozen world. Glaciers, ice sheets, permafrost, all together nearly three quarters of the planet's surface. As permafrost thaws, the report says, it could release vast quantities of greenhouse gases, unleashing a vicious circle of even faster warming. The rise in sea level is accelerating. By 2060, severe coastal floods, including off British Columbia and in Atlantic Canada, will become much more regular. What used to happen once a century will happen once a year. Some islands could become uninhabitable. And the ocean itself is changing too. More CO2 in the air means more CO2 in the water, and that makes it more acidic, less able to support life. Kelp forests that nurture sea life are threatened. Marine animal populations expected to drop 15%. And catches by fisheries in general are expected to decline by almost 25% by the end of the century. Now, the people who work in those coastal fisheries year after year are well-placed to keep an eye on the warming seas. Kayla Hounsell asked one family to describe the changes that they've seen. As sea levels rise and waters warm, there is also an increasing concern about what's happening beneath the waves to the species who live here. You can have winners and losers. I mean, I think the planet's going to be the loser either way. Two degrees kills the oceans, we're going to be we're the first to know. Three generations of fishermen. The Beatons have been fishing out of Ballantine's Cove for nearly 50 years. Together, they've noticed some changes. Probably the biggest single change that I would see is the lack of ice coverage that we used to get. Uh, from 71, the first 19 or so years that I fished, we, we had ice delays 13 or 14 years. I can only really think of a couple. They say the warming waters are also having an impact on the kind of species they see. Striped bass in particular were unheard of here. In 1971 when I was here, nobody knew what a striped bass was. 
Well, I was part of a group that tried to understand the effect of warming oceans on the ocean's productivity and what that does to fish. Boris Worm contributed some of the research assessed in the new report. And we're projecting that to the end of the century, under business as usual, we have may, may have about 17 percent less marine life in waters worldwide on average uh, than what we have today. Right now, the lobster fishery is stronger than ever as the crustaceans flock north looking for cooler water. But bait, like herring and mackerel, are already under duress. If those kind of lower, you know, bait fish or, or lower on the food chain fish can't survive, then the whole thing's over anyway. They believe the fishery can be sustained, but that will take constant adaptation to the changing climate. Kayla Hounsel, CBC News, Ballantine's Cove, Nova Scotia. Now, climate scientists say there's hope if net global emissions are cut by 45 percent by 2030. And whether Canada has the will to get there has been an issue on the campaign trail. Both the Conservatives and Liberals announced green initiatives, each of them directed at homeowners. But as David Cochran explains, we are talking about two very different plans to fight climate change. The leading parties are building on the climate plans they already have by promising to fix the house you already own. We're moving forward to make those retrofits affordable. Allow you to lower your home's emissions through green renovations. Energy efficient homes are the common destination, but the paths they're taking on climate change are very different. Justin Trudeau uh, has implemented the right kinds of policies. Mark Jackard says the carbon tax and tougher fuel standards are seen globally as the gold standard and that Canada has become a global leader on climate policy. Though to meet the Paris targets, Canada needs to do more. So at some point the carbon price probably has to go up, but if they don't want to do that, then they simply have to make their regulations tighter. Our realistic strategy will also give Canada the best chance to meet our Paris targets. Andrew Scheer wants to scrap the carbon tax and roll back regulations. His plan focuses on technology, forcing companies to invest in green tech if they pollute too much. When a government says I'm not going to put in pricing or regulations and instead we're going to have innovation or try to get other countries to do things, it's, it's a code word for uh, we're not really going to do anything. That shows up in Jackard's math. His modeling shows the Liberal plan will fall 79 megatons short of the Paris target. Boosting the carbon tax would fix that. The Conservative plan would fall 179 megatons short. And Scheer argues that Canadians shouldn't pay a carbon tax because Canada is a small emitter on the global scale. We can shut down our entire economy here and within a matter of days the production in China would replace everything that we produce here. We were no more than 2% of the Allied effort that defeated Nazi Germany. So is Andrew Scheer saying Canada should not have participated in World War II because we're such a small amount of it? It's the election issue that most divides the Liberals from the Conservatives, and the gap is at least 100 megatons wide. David Cochran, CBC News, Ottawa. Now both the NDP and the Greens say they'd surpass Canada's current target, which aims to reduce net greenhouse gas emissions to 30% below the 2005 level by 2030. We take the climate crisis seriously and we are committed to taking bold action, not just pretty words, but real action. New Democrats would so let's go through the them one by one. The NDP says it would reduce net greenhouse gas emissions by 38 percent instead, and it's laid out several ways to get there, including creating 300,000 green jobs and a climate bank to boost investment in green technology and energy. Science demands these actions. You can't negotiate with physics. And as for the Green Party, it wants to double the current target, cutting Canada's net emissions to 60% below the 2005 level by 2030, then hitting net zero by 2050. It's a key pillar of their overall platform. And today, the Parliamentary Budget Office released the costing for the party's entire plan. The Greens' most expensive promise, a universal drug plan that would cost nearly $27 billion in the first full year. Now, one more note on all of this. Elizabeth May is heading to Montreal tomorrow ahead of what's expected to be a major climate change protest on Friday. Teenage activist Greta Thunberg will also be there, fresh off her United Nations address. 
in all, tens of thousands are expected to take to the streets, and we will be there as well. The National will be coming to you live from Montreal starting tomorrow night. Facing a major backlash over hundreds of vaping-related illnesses and a spike in teens using e-cigarettes today, the company that controls about 70% of the U.S. market announced some major changes. But as Christine Birak tells us, in Canada, it is business as usual. With the cloud of a public health crisis hanging over it, Juul Labs USA announced there will be no more ads, no more pushback on regulating flavors, and the company's CEO is out. As for why now, in a statement, the company's new chief, a longtime tobacco executive, said unacceptable levels of youth usage and eroding public confidence in our industry. A recent survey suggested one in four American 12th graders had vaped nicotine within the previous month, and the number of people sickened by vaping-related illnesses continues to rise. What started as an exciting rite of passage turned into a terrifying near-death experience that involved a week-long hospital stay where my daughter went from a healthy, vibrant 18-year-old to a patient who needed rapidly increasing amounts of oxygen. Several states are already banning flavors, and Massachusetts has ordered a temporary stop to the sale of all vaping products. I'd be reluctant to give Juul any hero cookies about this. I think they were facing down uh, new regulations. But those new regulations he mentions are American. Jewel Labs Canada says it's not getting rid of any ads and it's following Canadian rules on flavors. Health experts say Health Canada needs to change those rules. I don't think we can rely upon the industry's goodwill here. If we want to protect kids, then we're probably going to need to regulate it and make that happen quickly. Up to one in five Canadian teens say they've used vape products. Some are now addicted to nicotine. Like, my body really told me I need to go, like, drive to the store, spend, like, $25, and then just, like, suck on something. A lot of, like, 15, 6-year-old people that I know that have started juuling and um, who never smoked before. So I think they really do need to cut back on the, on the advertising here for sure. I think that's ridiculous that they're not doing that here as well. Health Canada has said it's reviewing the situation. Christine Birak, CBC News, Toronto. More news ahead on the National, why there could be billions of tiny plastic particles in your teeth. Plus, they cost the government millions of dollars, so why are so many seniors getting B12 shots that they don't need? And later, we return to one of the border crossings that sparked a national debate. And Toronto Maple Leafs star Austin Matthews speaking out after being charged in Arizona. What he says about the allegations, his teammates, and there's new video from police too. Back in two minutes. Vitamin B12 shots are sometimes recommended as energy boosters. They're often given to seniors who are especially vulnerable to B12 deficiency. And those shots cost Canada's health care system millions. As Vicodopia explains, there is new evidence they may not even need them. Now it's the time. Kima Dwarka keeps her church group on key and in tune. So when she started feeling off, her doctor discovered the likely reason for her fatigue and low energy. She said to me, I don't know how you're standing on your feet. Your blood is so low. And so she gave me a B12 shot. Regular follow-up shots seem to work. Now Dwarka sings the praises of B12. I began to tell everybody I knew who would say, I am feeling tired. I said, are you taking B12? <laughs> Most of us get enough B12 from animal products such as meat, dairy and eggs. But people with bowel disorders and vegans are vulnerable to deficiency. So are seniors who lose the ability to absorb B12 from food with age. But that doesn't mean they all need B12 shots. I have seen many patients come into the emergency department on B12 injections without having a really good reason for it. This specialist reviewed patient records of Ontario seniors whose doctors prescribed B12 shots, nearly 150,000 people, but almost two thirds didn't actually have a lab confirmed deficiency. And the public cost for all those unnecessary shots, $45 million a year. We were surprised. Uh, we know that there was a lot of inappropriate care uh, that happens in Canada. B12 is having a moment. It's promoted as an energy booster and celebrities swear by it. 
A lot of this is that power of placebo. Vial of this gerontologist B12 rarely B12 prescribes B12 monthly B12 shots. He says for most seniors, store-bought tablets may actually work better, and a whole year of daily tablets costs less than one shot. But too much B12 has recently been associated with more hip fractures in older women. So unless you have a deficiency, Sina says skip it. B12 is one of those quiet vitamins that works in the body to help your memory, um, you know, stay sharp, if you will, to actually help your um, your nerves, you know, stay uh, stay more robust. Uh, but they don't; they're not necessarily prescribed to give people boosts of energy. As for Kima Dwarka, she switched from B12 shots to tablets, and she still has all the energy she needs. Vicodopia, CBC News, Toronto. Let's get you now to our national newsroom in Vancouver. Ian is watching several other stories for us tonight. And Andrew, let's begin with some news out of Montreal. The hockey legend Guy Lafleur is in hospital. He's awaiting a major heart operation. Sources confirming to CBC Sports the 68-year-old will undergo heart bypass surgery. The Hall of Famer played more than 1,000 games during 14 seasons in Montreal, helping lead the franchise to five Stanley Cups. Lafleur's family expected to release an update on his condition tomorrow. In Toronto, Maple Leaf star Austin Matthews is apologizing to fans and teammates as we learn more about a disorderly conduct charge against him. Uh, you know, I regret, uh, you know, any of my actions that would ever, you know, put a distraction on the team or, or distress any individual. Police documents describe the alleged incident in Scottsdale, Arizona in May. Matthews accused of being part of a group which approached a woman in her locked car around 2 a.m. and tried to open the door. She confronted them and claims Matthews then pulled down his pants. I saw his underwear. Okay. And I know he spread his... His cheeks? Yeah. Matthews' next court date set for October 22nd. And here in Vancouver, more than 100 logging trucks disrupted rush hour traffic, protesting job losses in the forest industry. If, if we don't do something, it's just going to get worse. The trucks line the streets of downtown Vancouver, where municipal and provincial politicians have gathered for annual meetings. The drivers are hoping to pressure the Premier into providing more government aid for thousands of workers who are now unemployed. In recent months, more than two dozen mills have shut down or cut shifts across BC. It's time for a quick break, but when we come back, we'll take you to the front lines of climate change, the warming waters off the Pacific coast, in depth, next on The National. We got lucky here today, didn't we? We got so lucky. These conditions are so calm, it's yeah. beautiful. But looks can be deceiving, as we heard earlier in the hour. That placid surface hides a devastating threat. The oceans have been like a giant buffer against the effects of greenhouse gases absorbing heat and carbon dioxide from the warming atmosphere. But it's taking a toll. The impact is being felt here on the West Coast, so we took about a three-hour drive south to Puget Sound in Washington State to see how scientists and the seafood industry are tracking a changing ocean. Taylor Shellfish describes itself as the largest producer of farmed oysters and clams in the United States. So these are diploid Pacific oysters. But it all starts small, microscopically small. A kilogram of this stuff is actually more than 100 million oyster larvae, sifted, sorted, washed in seawater. So honestly, they don't look that impressive when they're in those big buckets, but through a microscope, you can tell how, well, first of all, that they're alive, that they're active, and they're ready for the next stage. But 10 years ago, these larvae were dying off and no one could figure out why. This is how they're supposed to look after three months. But up and down the coast, something in the water was killing the oysters before they could develop their shells. It's different colors are different species of plankton that we grow to feed them. As we walk by tanks of algae, food for the shellfish, Bill Dewey says it took industry, the state and federal governments, and universities to figure out what was wrong. Acidification of the ocean, the result of increased carbon dioxide being absorbed into the water. These are some baby gooey duck clams. 
Dewey says in Washington state, there was no debate about the problem or the cause. We need everybody's help to reduce our dependence on fossil fuels and get at the CO2 pollution problem because that's what's changing the chemistry of the ocean and affecting our ability to grow our baby oysters. Acidification is one of the problems in the waters here off Washington State, and we're heading out to look at one of the buoys that they use to, to measure that. But it's also monitoring water temperature. And right now, Washington State, or at least the waters here off Washington State, are having their second marine heat wave in five years. A network of solar-powered buoys deployed by the University of Washington reaches deep into the water sending data 24 hours a day, seven days a week for 15 years. We are in the Salish Sea, which is a large inland water body that goes from Canada to the state of Washington. We're Professor Jan Newton says in July, the buoys along the coast recorded seawater temperatures as high as four degrees Celsius above average. The data available online. When you see red, that means warmer. And what you can see is the full water column was warmer than the long-term average. So that's telling us the presence of the marine heat wave is here in Puget Sound. What's the implication of that? So the implication is a bit unknown at this point. But what is known, say scientists, is the impact of that marine heat wave a few years ago. A decline in salmon stocks, a surge in the number of dead birds, and stresses on mammals like sea lions searching further for food. In science, we talk about multiple stressors, and I think in everybody's life they know that, right? You know, you're stressed about your budget, you're stressed about your job, you're stressed about your kids or whatever. And when you have multiple forms of stress, that's when you start to perform less. And the warming waters extend far beyond Puget Sound. So the upper 700 meters here, 700 to 2,000 meters. And Greg Johnson is an oceanographer with NOAA, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. Not only does he know how much more heat the oceans are absorbing, he knows how to describe it. The ocean is at warming at an average rate of about uh, 10 zettajoules a year, which is 330 terawatts. Again, a terawatt is something with 12 zeros after it. Take my word for it, it's a huge number. This is equivalent uh, to the energy of five Hiroshima bombs a second exploding continuously uh, from 1993 through the present. Think about that for a moment. Johnson says that almost unfathomable amount of heat trapped by greenhouse gases has been absorbed by the oceans for more than 25 years, extending deep below the surface. Yeah, so these are Argo profiling floats. Mm -hmm. The hard evidence of ocean warming is coming from these. There's a network of more than 3,700 in oceans around the world, sending readings every 10 days to scientists. Data that's critical to understanding the impact of global warming on our oceans. And, says Johnson, also a little disheartening. Over time, uh, since the 90s, uh, it has become clearer and clearer that measuring this warming ocean is more and more important. You know, initially I was kind of excited because my science is getting more re relevant as time goes on. Now I'm, it's kind of depressing, actually. It's a hard thing to study. We do need to take action. In the meantime, there are some short-term fixes. Now that shellfish farmers know acidification prevented the oyster larvae from forming shells, they monitor the pH levels in the water coming into the hatchery and keep the acid levels down. This is where the science happens in right. here, yeah. In here is the Berkelator, named after the professor who developed it. It continuously monitors carbon dioxide in the water. But Dewey says the scientist who helped him also had a warning. Acidification will rise. Even if you can convince the world to stop burning fossil fuels today, this problem is going to get worse for you for the next 30 to 50 years because of what's already absorbed in the Pacific Ocean and in the pipeline coming your way. It's a scenario Newton knows well, but she worries the message isn't being heard. I woke up this morning and I heard on the news and it was like all about the um, stock reports and the ec economics and I'm just wishing that people were thinking, oh, the temperature anomaly in Puget Sound is two degrees Celsius, and the temperature anomaly in Nanaimo is whatever it is. You know, I wish there was a higher awareness of that.
And that does seem to be a source of hope among the people we talk to here, that the cold, hard data may lead to a greater awareness of warming waters. And Andrew, I should point out in our brief travels around Seattle, it does seem the story of the changes in the ocean is getting a fair amount of attention in Washington state. And you mentioned how many different organizations responded to the shellfish crisis. And, and I found it surprising. You have competing companies working together, a couple of the big universities, but also government has been very involved. The state of Washington has taken the lead in identifying the impacts of climate change. And NOAA, and keep in mind that is a federal agency, it's been very involved as well. So in a country whose politics are so often divided, on this issue, at least in one state, there has been a coordinated effort. Okay, Ian. Well, another danger to oceans, microplastics, tiny particles of plastic that have been found in products like water bottles and food packaging. We know they pollute the environment, but what's less clear, the health impacts of consuming them. And it turns out they might be lurking in your morning tea. Alison Northcott explains. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna empty them. Laura Hernandez is simulating the research she did on plastic tea bags. These ones are the plastic tea bags that we use for this study. They're popular, but a McGill University study published today found four different brands of tea bags made of nylon and a type of plastic called polyethylene terephthalate left minuscule particles in the hot water. What we found was there are, is that there are billions of micro and nano particles of plastics coming out of the tea bag. We were expecting to see some particles being released from a plastic tea bag. You're putting it into very hot water. What surprised us is, is the quantity that we discovered. You know, we're talking about billions of particles. The study didn't look at the health impact of consuming microplastics. And while other studies have found the minuscule particles in some drinking water, the World Health Organization says there's no evidence yet that that is a risk to human health. That's why some researchers say more study is needed. What we know very little about is what the effects are to human health. And there's this real call to action that we should understand more what the effects are because these microplastics are getting into us. Those unknowns give tea drinker Lisa McDonald pause. I would rather have the choice between drinking a tea that I know is not going to have these particles um, and a tea that like maybe there could be a warning sign or something. But others aren't bothered. He says breathing in emissions from cars is worse. In a statement, the Tea and Herbal Association of Canada raised questions about some of the study's findings and said it wants to reassure consumers that drinking tea is a safe and healthy lifestyle choice. The researchers say they don't deny that, but stand by their peer-reviewed study. Alison Northcott, CBC News, Montreal. Okay, ahead on the national, more on a wild day in Washington. Where does it leave Donald Trump, his party, and the Democrats hoping to replace him? We'll see you in two minutes. It's a joke. Impeachment for that? When you have a wonderful meeting or you have a wonderful phone conversation? So, let's return to this top story tonight. A dizzying day in Washington. The allegation that Donald Trump pressured Ukraine's president to investigate his political rival, Joe Biden. Well, today, a summary of the phone call at the center of it was released. Democrats say it proves their point. Trump says there's nothing to prove because there was no pressure. So that leaves the Republicans to defend him. But will they all tow the party line? And if so, for how long? Mike Murphy is a Republican consultant who's worked for many GOP politicians, including Mitt Romney, John McCain. So, Mike, yesterday you wrote in the Washington Post that you were in favor of impeachment. That was even before any record of the conversation came out between the president and the Ukrainian president. It's out now. So now what's your thought? Well, I think things have gotten worse for the president. He implied that the White House notes of the call would exonerate him. Instead, we see him leaning on the Ukrainians to do political favors for him, which is a huge violation of his oath of office, hence the stampede closer to impeachment today. But help us understand something here, because, you know, from afar, we, we've heard the Americans talk about the Russia investigation and, and Democrats hinted impeachment for almost years now. What is so different about this situation that in a matter of a week, They've gone to this. Well, this narrative is so much simpler. The Mueller stuff was a complicated web of Trump henchmen getting into trouble. This is really clean. President on the phone leaning on a foreign leader trying to extract political help and interference in our elections. 
putting the national interest way below his own. And that clearly violates the oath of office and the president is right in the center of it. The whistleblower complaint that's now at our intelligence committees may even provide more damaging material. Speaking of damaging though, to what degree is this actually an advantage for Trump and damaging for the Democrats? Well, there's one scenario, I don't necessarily believe it, but some people think if Trump can survive a Senate vote, if there is impeachment in the House, it goes to the Senate for a trial, two thirds needed to uh, impeach him and he survives, he can say he's exonerated. I think the stain will be on him and Republican politicians will start making a very tough calculation about whether or not Trump or Pence at the top of the ticket may be better for him next year. Okay, but y you are a Republican, you know, you are for, I am. impeachment. And when you talk about the Republican controlled Senate, what is the likelihood that they would actually break away and, and, and vote for impeachment? Well, one, I'm hoping they do the right thing should the facts present as bad of a situation for Trump's actions as I believe they've begun to do. And second, they have to make a tough political calculation uh, they want to very badly damage Donald Trump at the top of the ticket and start losing Republican seats in swing areas like Colorado, Arizona, and Maine. Do you have any evidence that they would do that? Any suggestion that they would actually do that? Well, I talked to one Republican senator who told me if it was a secret vote, and you know, where their votes were not recorded, that senator thought at least two dozen or more Republican senators would vote to uh, dump Trump, so to speak. Not a secret ballot. But anyway, Mike Murphy, thank you very, very much. We appreciate that. Thank you. And we're back in two minutes with more developing news on The National. Plus, we return to Roxham Road, where tens of thousands of asylum seekers have crossed into Canada. That's still ahead. Welcome back to our national newsroom in Vancouver. An outspoken supporter of Syria's president has lost his job as honorary consul in Montreal. Canada's foreign affairs minister says she ordered officials to revoke Wasim Ramli's status. This follows a McLean's article that outlined his strong support of the Bashar al-Assad regime. Christopher Freeland says Ramli never should have been approved by Global Affairs to serve as honorary consul. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu will get a chance to form the country's next government after that inconclusive national election. Israel's president handed the task to Netanyahu today after power-sharing talks with his strongest rival, Benny Gantz, failed. Last week's general election, the second this year, ended in deadlock. Netanyahu, Israel's longest-serving prime minister, will now have up to six weeks to try to put together a government. And the Duke and Duchess of Sussex continued their tour of Africa today with a special appearance by the youngest royal. Baby Archie was with the couple as they met with retired Archbishop Desmond Tutu. It is the first royal engagement for the infant, who sat on his mother's lap while his father chatted with the 87-year-old South African human rights activist. Tutu called the visit a rare privilege and an honor. It's the first overseas tour for the royal family since Archie's birth in May. Next on The National, we head back to the border. So if you cross here, you will be arrested by the police. This is where so many asylum seekers are coming to Canada. We'll look at what has and hasn't changed since we first visited. The immigration conversation in this election campaign is very different than in the last. In 2015, Justin Trudeau campaigned and won on a promise to bring more Syrian refugees to Canada. But... That was before an unprecedented number of asylum seekers from all over started coming across the U.S. border. In 2017, Susan Ormiston witnessed that surge at an unauthorized crossing point in Quebec. Tonight, her return to see what's changed and, crucially, what hasn't. Roxham Road, just a pretty country corner in upstate New York. But around the world, it's infamous. Not a dead end, but a well-traveled path for migrants. 50,000 have come this way in two years, headed for Canada. Tony Hogel's seen lots of them. He lives up the road. They don't bother anybody. They just keep on their way, go up and cross the border. They're doing a good thing. Get the hell out of, get out of Dodge. Taxis bring them one after another from the bus or the train or the Plattsburgh airport. This past summer, 
about 60 a day, still down from the peak in 2017. They're from all over, displaced from Yemen, Turkey, Sri Lanka, Nigeria, many from Central America. Where are you from? No hablo inglés. Uh, Spanish? Española. Colombiana. Colombia. This family says they are escaping threats, and once across, they'll apply for asylum. Half of those who've tried have been accepted. They seem to know what to expect, each step of the drill, anticipating well-rehearsed warnings. So if you cross here, you will be arrested by the police. Do you understand? Yeah. Okay, and I'm not going to invite you to come in. It's your decision, okay? okay? Decision made, there's no turning back. One moment. Now you are in Canada, okay? You're under arrest for illegal entry to Canada. Do you understand? It is technically Hello. illegal to cross the border here, yes, but no, once no, in no, Canada, no, it no, is no, legal no, to apply for no, asylum, no, and that's no, why they're no, here. No, a Nigerian woman dropped off by taxi is following a sibling. She was alone. Her brother's already here. Oh. Did you take him as yes. well? Yes. When does that happen? That was two months ago. Check out his sign. 60 bucks for the ride to the border. Many charge more. Business so brisk they brand themselves border shuttles. The Liberal government is struggling to dissuade migrants from using this route. They've launched social media and advertising campaigns in Venezuela, Colombia, Mexico, Nigeria, Pakistan, but still they're coming. Tents have been upgraded to a permanent building. More signs warn that this is not a free ticket to Canada. Janet McFedrich has been coming here nearly every day for two years, bringing comfort. If this were to be closed, I think people would cross at all the places along this long, what, 3,000 mile border that we share into very, very unsafe situations where they're in the middle of some field or forest and uh, with children. If they were to go through the official border, they could be turned back to the U.S. under the safe third country agreement. Here on the Quebec side, the border's just down there, the federal government has compensated residents for ongoing RCMP traffic. Yvonne Carrier got $2,500. This kind of immigration seems to be wanted by the federal government, easier to control this way. But in Hemingford, the closest Quebec town, there are signs of division. You got plenty of people here, you got nothing to eat, and then they come over there, they get everything they want. Come on in. <laughs> You're welcome to come into Canada. It's a free country here, and hopefully they can find uh, refuge here, you know. This was an NDP riding, but it's up for grabs this election. And on Frontier Road, outside the fittingly named Wits End Restaurant. They should put a, a fence, <laughs> that's it. And just uh, go by the, by the door, the front door, see, hello? Right. Not beside it. Back at Plattsburgh, early morning, the overnight bus from New York City delivers more migrants into those taxis. A few more hopefuls, posing an intractable problem for government. Susan Ormiston, CBC News, on the U.S.-Canada border. Time for a quick break. The moment is next. It really was an early one in Winnipeg today. Why were all these people lined up? You might be surprised. So check out that lineup. It's not for a store, it's not for a concert, it is for a court. People in Winnipeg got up at the crack of dawn this morning to witness history. Inside that building, they watched the first Supreme Court of Canada hearing to ever be held outside of Ottawa, and that is our moment. My plan had been to be here at four or five in the morning, but I slept in. I'm happy that I can get in and get a front row seat to history. It's something that, you know, Canadians don't normally get to do unless they go to Ottawa. So, and them coming here to Winnipeg, and it's not all of Western Canada, but it's a big opportunity. Making it clear that they care about what the public thinks is hugely important. I think this is uh, historic. Just to, to see the court in operation, the highest court in the land, I think it's super exciting. Um, I've read the materials, and so I'm interested in the, the case and the decision that they're going to come to. So, <laughs> might come back tomorrow. <laughs>
<laughs> well, I love that you read the materials. You know, you don't have to wait for the Supreme Court. There are courts right across the country. I think every Canadian should at least spend a day visiting. But be prepared. It's not as exciting as Law and Order. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, I'd be interested to know if some of those clips that we just heard, were they taken before the hearing or <laughs> after their hearing? If we only heard them before, I'd be curious to know what they thought afterwards. Uh, just giving your point, yeah. I, 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 this makes me very proud to be a Canadian. I think this is fantastic. Yeah. And I know you, Hanno. I've known you for, like, what, 28 years now. You have a law degree. You'd be the first one in line there. I know it. 100%. That is a national for September 25th. Good night. Good night. Good night.